This museum is older than the Air Force. Having begun our institutional history in 1923, we obviously we predate the Air Force. That's because the story of air power is not only about the United States Air Force and now the Space Force, but it's about the U.S. Army Air Forces of World War II, the Army Air Corps before that, the U.S. Air Service before that, and the Army Signal Corps Aviation Section before that. There are predecessor organizations that are all about air power, but the names and duties of the organizations change over time. And we follow that thread right back to the beginning of military aviation. This museum has not always existed right here on this spot. Its first home was kind of in downtown-ish Dayton, down by the Great Miami River at McCook Field, which no longer exists. Now, McCook Field was always a small airfield, and so it had a small museum, only 24,000 some square feet. It was little. Well, the Air Service quickly outgrew McCook Field, and Wright Field was established. In 1927, all the stuff moved to Wright Field. And over time, this museum has existed in a couple of different places around Wright Field and Patterson Field and then back to historic Wright Field here. So you can see, for example, the 1935 super beautiful Art Deco building in Area B of this base that was originally built as a museum. It's now offices because the museum outgrew it but it was originally made as a museum, and it's just up the street from our main campus now. This museum was also once located in a giant old engine refurbishment facility over on Patterson Field. It was a problematic building. It had giant pillars inside of it that made it hard to move airplanes around, and it made it a really complicated proposition to mount exhibits in there, but just the same, that's what they had, that's what they used, and they accomplished that exhibit and preservation mission in there with a lot of airplanes outside. Now, when this campus was created in 1971, all of those aircraft and a lot of those exhibits and the rest of the collection was moved over here from Patterson Field, and all this was done on local roads. And so you had this kind of elephant walk of airplanes coming over here towed on the roads, in a lot of cases with their wings removed and so on. And this was a huge public event to see airplanes like the XB-70 going over a bridge on a road. The same bridge is there, you can see it today and imagine what, what would that look like coming across the bridge. So all these aircraft did this great big move from there to here. President Nixon arrived at the museum to, to dedicate the place. Uh, he arrived on Air Force One, what we know as SAM-26000 today. That very airplane is now part of our collection in the Presidential Gallery. And when our present campus was established, it was less than a quarter of what it is today. It was just the two you know, first buildings with the administrative part in the middle. But in the early 1970s, that was huge. That was a great big deal. And of course, we kept growing and growing and growing. And the aircraft kept getting bigger and the collection kept getting bigger. And so one building after another was added until you have what we have today, four giant buildings, a missile gallery, the memorial park, and of course, the collection storage behind the scenes in Area B. It all takes up about, just about 20 acres of exhibit space that the public can walk through. So it's, it's a big place. When the fourth building was built, we moved just about the entire aircraft collection. And just like the first move in the early 1970s from Patterson Field to Wright Field, this move was a big public event. We had bleachers set up and everything, and about 270 airframes had to move 
and get reshuffled in a huge reconfiguration of all of the galleries involved. When you have 270,000 square feet of new empty space, you need to reshuffle your galleries. And that's what our restoration crews did. They moved one giant airplane after the other, and it was all a big public show that you could come and watch. Planning that and planning how these big machines are supposed to fit into the gallery is like six-dimensional chess because you have to satisfy a bunch of different needs. It's not just about what will fit where, but it's about does it make sense as a story, as a framework on which to hang exhibits that make sense over time? Does it satisfy the needs for electricity and water and heating and cooling and safety and egress and all that stuff? And finally, does it provide a way for our restorers to reshuffle it and take things out and put things in if they need to. All of these things have to be planned and negotiated and then they have to be executed in real life with giant machines. It's very, very complicated. I have a great deal of admiration for the ability to think through that thing in three dimensions to make that puzzle happen. There's something for everybody. There's, if you're a hardware geek, this is your place. If you are an Air Force culture story person and you want to learn about what this job was like or what this person experienced, this is also your place. Lately, we've been mounting other exhibits specifically aimed at making a more diverse and equitable story of our heritage. So we've got a lot of women in the Air Force exhibits mounted throughout the museum in different galleries. And we're also working on expanding the story of the enlisted force because it's not all about commissioned officers as pilots. It's not all about that. There's a million different jobs in our heritage done by a million different kinds of different people with different skills and backgrounds. And so profiling a good slice of that heritage is our job. That's what we're here to do. So we're telling more and more stories about more and more different kinds of people. It's a big project, um, but we're very happy to have embarked on that. And those two things together, the big impressive machines and the people stories and the artifacts that go with them, that makes the whole story complete.